Hello everybody, this is Dr. Omid and in this video I'm going to uh, finish the rest of the bones of the visceral cranium or splanchnic cranium uh, which are palatine bone, maxilla and mandible. Hopefully, hopefully this video will be useful for you. This is palatine bone. The palatine bone uh, is a, a paired bone, so it means we have the left and right palatine bone. And uh, this bone, uh, it uh, looks like a letter uh, L uh, because it has one perpendicular plate and one horizontal plate, so it looks like a letter L. And uh, it's located uh, and is related anteriorly uh, to the maxilla and posteriorly uh, is related to the uh, sphenoid bone, respectively the pterygoid uh, process of the sphenoid bone. Uh, here, if you uh, see the position of the uh, the position of the uh, palatine bone, so here you can see the uh, pterygoid process of the uh, sphenoid bone, and uh, anterior to that you can see this part, which is a palatine bone, and uh, anteriorly also you can see here is the maxilla, is the palatine process of maxilla, and here is the horizontal plate of the uh, palatine bone. So, uh, posteriorly is related to the pterygoid um, process of the sphenoid bone and anteriorly is related to the uh, maxilla. So, uh, we said that is L-shaped bone, so it means that we have this part which is called a horizontal plate uh, of the uh, palatine bone and it's uh, forming and uh, the other one is the perpendicular plate of the palatine bone here and in the at the transitional place of the perpendicular and horiz horizontal plate uh, we have this structure uh, or a process which is called pyramidal process which is directed dorso caudo uh, laterally we are going to discuss about the little, uh, details. The horizontal plate, it's forming the posterior one-third, some literature they said posterior one-fourth of the heart palate here. It has two surfaces, one surface which is toward the nasal cavity, in this surface is called, or superior surface or nasal surface is called and the other surface which is going toward the oral cavity uh, and is forming the heart palate is called the palatine surface. Anteriorly, here, the uh, horizontal plate is uh, fused with the, or it fit with the um, palatine process of the maxilla uh, at the suture which is called transverse palatine suture. I can show you here in this picture. Here you have the horizontal plate of the palatine bone and here is the palatine process of the maxilla and this suture that you can see is the place that the horizontal plate is uh, fusing with the, uh, with the palatine process of the maxilla at this suture which is called transverse palatine suture here. Then uh, back to this, and of course here you have the uh, part of the heart palate. This is the uh, full part of the heart palate, which is the anterior two-third, or some literature they call anterior three-quarter of the uh, heart palate. It's made by the maxilla, and posterior one-third or posterior one-fourth is made by the horizontal plate of the palatine bone. So uh, back to this place. Uh, if we go toward the posterior side here, posterior side, the posterior border of the palatine bone here in this region is free border, which is called palatine crest, and here is the attachment of the palatine aponeurosis, is the basic structure for the attachment of the muscles of the soft palate that we are going to discuss uh, in the case uh, at the session of the. Uh, gastrointestinal tract. So here is the palatine crest, this is the posterior free border of the, uh, of the uh, palatine bone, the, horiz the horizontal plate. And uh, exactly on this place, 
you have uh, the spine which is called the posterior nasal spine and this place uh, and this part it's the uh, it's the place for attachment of the muscle and other muscles of the soft palate which is called ovula so ovula it's ovule musculis uh, ovule is the paired muscle that in the center when you are saying uh, ah the doctor can say at the midline there is a hanging of the uh, muscle which is called uh, ovule uh, and here is a place of the attachment the posterior uh, posterior nasal spine here so as we mentioned uh, here the horizontal plate above uh, or superior surface is called nasal surface because partly is making a floor of the nasal cavity and at this point of the midline you have a crest which is called nasal crest and uh, to this nasal crest is attaching the uh, the vomer which is making a dorsocaudal part of the nasal uh, septum uh, let me uh, show you in this uh, picture or in this preparation. Uh, here, as I said, it's the uh, horizontal plate of the palatine bone. Here, as I said, that here is the transverse palatine suture, which is connecting in front with the palatine process of the maxilla. And here is that free border that we said it that is called the uh, palatine crest and is attachment of the palatine aponeurosis. And here, after the junction with the other uh, palatine bone, with the uh, of the horizontal plate of the other palatine horizontal plate of the other palatine bone, here in this area is the posterior nasal spine for the attachment of the uh, musculi uvule. Uh, as uh, we mentioned it here, so here. It's the palatine surface of the horizontal plate, which is making a part of the heart palate, so that's why they call it palatine surface. And if I show you inside, here is the posterior part of the nasal cavity, and here is the nasal surface of the, or superior surface of the horizontal plate of the palatine bone, which is making the uh, floor of the uh, nasal cavity. This is the view to the nasal cavity from the posterior side. This opening is called Juane. And uh, here at the center, it was a, uh, at the midline, it was a crest, which is called nasal crest. And here you can see partly the vomer, which is attaching to this uh, nasal septum. So this is, uh, uh, this is uh, the structure that is uh, important at the uh, horizontal plate of the palatine bone and in this case since I have it so you can see the uh, foramen or uh, opening which is a very important opening here it's called the it's called the uh, greater palatine foramen greater palatine foramen it's very important uh, foramen for uh, dentistry uh, here is the place that we are applying the anesthesia uh, it's the block anesthesia for the greater palatine nerve uh, and in this case we are doing the numbness of the uh, palatine part of the uh, of the um, uh, heart palate uh, till the uh, till the premaxillary region or incisive region that I'm going to uh, discuss. So through the greater palatine foramen, it passed the uh, uh, the greater palatine nerve and vessels. And if I uh, put the needle uh, or the wire inside inside uh, this uh, foramen, if you go it upward, you will reach to the canal, which is called the uh, the greater palatine canal, here the wire is now is inside, upward, to the greater palatine canal, or another name is called pterygopalatine canal. This canal is formed by the uh, groove uh, that is uh, between a groove uh, which is located uh, at the perpendicular plate of the palatine bone uh, at the lateral surface of the uh, palatine bone with the uh, medial or nasal surface of the maxilla so uh, we have two grooves and these two grooves they are making when I joining together so they are making this canal which is called uh, uh, greater palatine canal 
and or another name is the pterygopalatine canal and through this groove it passes the greater uh, palatine nerve and descending palatine artery. This uh, greater palatine nerve from the canal it's coming out and greater palatine nerve is continue here but the descending palatine artery when it reach to this place then it's giving another branch which is the greater palatine uh, artery uh, and vein also it's passing here in this region so through the foramen it passed the greater palatine nerve and uh, vessels but through the canal it passed greater palatine nerve is the same but the descending palatine uh, artery uh, and vein also so here uh, also I can show you uh, about the, this uh, this um, uh, groove that I mentioned it here so this is the opening of the of the greater palatine canal if I show you from the other side this is the uh, greater palatine foramen that the wire is coming out to the palatine side of the uh, palatine side of the uh, uh, horizontal plate and this wire that it passed this groove it's passing here you can see very nice this groove this is the lateral surface of the perpendicular plate of the uh, palatine bone and it's a groove that is matched with the other groove that is in the nasal surface of the maxilla and it's making the greater palatine canal or the pterygopalatine uh, canal which is passing the descending palatine uh, artery and the greater palatine nerve and is ending to this foramen that we mentioned and is the greater uh, palatine foramen. It's very important. So uh, that's all about the uh, about the horizontal plate, and uh, we are going to discuss about the uh, perpendicular uh, plate. The perpendicular plate of the uh, uh, palatine bone anteriorly it's uh, related to the uh, uh, to the nasal surface of the maxilla, and uh, so partly it's uh, covering the uh, maxillary hiatus and is obliterating the maxillary hiatus uh, from the posterior side uh, so there is diminishing the, uh, the uh, opening of the maxillary sinus which is called maxillary hiatus uh, in anterior uh, aspect and uh, in posterior aspect the uh, perpendicular plate of the palatine bone is uh, fitting with the uh, anterior part of the medial uh, plate of the pterygoid process. Let me show you in this uh, skull, articulated skull. So, uh, as you see, here is the uh, pterygoid process. Here is the pterygoid process of the sphenoid bone. Here is the lateral that we said that is flat and it's large. And here is the medial uh, plate of the uh, uh, pterygoid process. And here the anterior aspect of the medial plate is fusing with this part which is called the, uh, the posterior which is the posterior uh, part of the perpendicular plate of the uh, ethmoidal uh, uh, of the palatine bone so anteriorly uh, i don't know if uh, you can uh, see or not so my wire it's going to toward the toward the uh, toward the um, maxillary hiatus and uh, we are going to discuss it and the maxilla in the upper jaw uh, the maxillary hiatus which is partly it's it's covered by the perpendicular plate of the uh, palatine uh, bone so back to this uh, to this perpendicular plate as you see the perpendicular plate uh, it has the lateral surface which is here and in this lateral surface you can see this groove uh, for the uh, greater uh, palatine uh, groove or greater palatine sulcus here and uh, here it's the uh, nasal surface and uh, it's making a wall of the nasal cavity and at the nasal surface of the uh, of the perpendicular plate we have two crests 
one crest which is uh, downward and it's inferiorly and is uh, more or less nearly its horizontally is located is this crest very nice you can see here uh, it's called the Konhal crest the Konhal crest is the place for attachment of the uh, inferior nasal concha so the inferior nasal concha is attaching to the Konhal crest at the uh, medial or nasal surface of the perpendicular plate of the ethmoidal bone, uh, of the palatine bone, sorry. Then uh, we have the, uh, another uh, crest which is not that, that much well seen here. It's the uh, diagonal shape and is superiorly is located and uh, in this area you can see and uh, it's called the uh, ethmoidal uh, crest. And this ethmoidal crest is the place for attachment of the middle nasal concha. So here it's the attachment of the middle nasal concha. Again, uh, let me uh, show you maybe in this uh, preparation. You can catch. So again, if you look at it, so here is the here is the, uh, the uh, pterygoid process of the sphenoid bone. Again, lateral plate, and here is the medial plate. And here is the perpendicular plate of the uh, palatine bone. And this is the nasal surface. As you see, here is the nasal cavity. And you can see very nice this crest. This is called conchal crest. And if you look at it inside here, what I'm pointing it, it's the it's the inferior nasal concha here, and above that is this diagonal obliquely oriented crest, which is called ethmoidal crest, and this is the place for the attachment of the middle nasal concha here. So these two crests, the conchal and the ethmoidal crest, they are also can be found in the uh, nasal surface of the frontal process of the maxilla that I'm going to uh, discuss. So back to the back to the perpendicular plate of the uh, of the palatine bone. In the superior uh, in the superior part. Of the of the uh, perpendicular plate of the uh, palatine bone, we have two processes. Two processes. One which is located more anteriorly and is located uh, more and more uh, toward the lateral side and is bigger comparing to the other, which is here is called orbital process. So the orbital process at the superior part of the, uh, of the uh, perpendicular plate and it's located uh, more anteriorly and it's bigger and more laterally. This orbital process of the palatine bone it's forming and is uh, fitting exactly in the transitional place uh, between the floor of the uh, orbit and the medial part of the or medial wall of the orbit in the posterior portion so that we are going to discuss uh, in the uh, wall of the orbit so the orbital process it's at the transitional place uh, between the floor of the orbit and the medial wall of the orbit posteriorly so this is the orbital uh, process so posteriorly there is a smaller process which is located more dorsally and more medially is called a sphenoid process. This sphenoid process is related toward the sphenoid bone and in this case here between the orbital process and the sphenoid process you can see an, a, a notch which is called sphenopalatine notch. The sphenopalatine notch is the place between the 
between the orbital process and sphenoidal process of the palatine bone, and this is called sphenopalatine notch. So later, that in articulated skull in a while, I'm going to show you, if my finger, it will be a body of the sphenoid bone, and uh, this two process, they are related to the body of the sphenoid bone, so it's articulated, and now we don't have the notch, but we have the foramen, which is called sphenopalatine foramen, sphenopalatine foramen. So the sphenopalatine notch, after uh, articulating or diffusing with the, uh, or connecting with the body of the sphenoid bone, so the notch, it will be closed, and it remaining the uh, the foramen, which is called the sphenopalatine uh, foramen, that it's very important, which is uh, a place for the communication of the pterygopalatine fossa uh, uh, in this area with the nasal cavity uh, with this area. Let me show you in the, uh, at the articulated uh, skull. So here, it's the, uh, we are going to discuss, here is the area which is called infratemporal fossa. This is the posterior aspect of the maxilla. This is the infratemporal uh, surface of the greater wing of the sphenoid bone here. And this is the temporal one. So here in this area is infratemporal fossa. Infratemporal fossa ventromedially through this fissure, which is called pterygomaxillary fissure, is communicating with this small fossa, which is called pterygopalatine fossa. And pterygopalatine fossa, if I go medially, my wire is going inside the foramen, which is, is the same foramen that you can see that is open to the nasal cavity, very nice. You see the red wire. It's the communication of the pterygopalatine fossa, which is the wire is inside. And through the medial wall of the pterygopalatine fossa, it's communicating with the nasal cavity through the sphenol palatine foramen. Through the sphenopalatine foramen, it passed the sphenopalatine artery, and also it passed the nerves, which is called posterior superior nasal branches, that they are dividing to the medial or septal and lateral branches. The posterior superior nasal branches or nerves that they are subdivided to the medial or septal and the lateral uh, posterior superior nasal nerves, plus the sphenopalatine artery. So this is very important communication of the pterygopalatine fossa we are going to discuss uh, with the nasal cavity. So <coughs> back to the palatine bone, the, uh, uh, another process, so as you see we have three processes. One process, the orbital process, the other process was the sphenoid process, and the other process which is, looks like a pyramidal shape, is called pyramidal process. It's between the uh, uh, perpendicular plate and the horizontal plate, uh, it's directed dorso caudo laterally. This is the pyramidal pr uh, process and this is the place for the attachment of the super superficial head of the medial uh, pterygoid muscle, which is uh, a masticatory muscle we are going to discuss in the temporomandibular uh, joint. So inside this um, pterygoid uh, py pyramidal process, there are some canals that they are passing, there are two, three canals that they are passing through, and those are called the lesser palatine canals. And the lesser palatine canals in the palatine surface, it means that in this surfaces, uh, surface, it's open as a, as a uh, uh, lesser palatine foramens. So you can see it here. <coughs> 
here I have one and two so there are the two or three usually foramens we have here which is they are opening to the palatine surface of the uh, of the pyramidal process and through this canal which is inside the pyramidal process and this foramen which is uh, in the palatine surface of the uh, pyramidal process it has the same name uh, nerves and vessels so it means that the lesser uh, lesser uh, palatine nerve and uh, nerves and the lesser palatine vessels they are passing for supplying the uh, soft uh, palate here in front of that we were discussing at the horizontal plate of the uh, palatine bone it was the greater palatine foramen is the opening of the greater palatine canal or pterygopalatine canal here that it was the greater palatine nerve and vessels for supplying of the hard palate so here uh, there are the uh, important uh, feature and structure that uh, we can have it uh, for the palatine bone. Okay, next bone of the uh, splanchnocranium or viscerocranium is maxilla, uh, which is upper jaw. Uh, maxilla is very important bone uh, because uh, the shape of the maxilla is uh, forming the shape of your face. Uh, also, uh, uh, maxilla, uh, it's uh, important uh, bone which, are, which is making or forming the uh, main part of the, uh, the uh, heart palate, the anterior two-third or anterior three-quarter of the heart palate. Also, uh, maxilla, uh, it's uh, containing inside the uh, paranasal sinus, which is uh, maxillary sinus is the largest paranasal sinus of the uh, body, so it's considered as a nomadic uh, bone. Uh, maxilla also, it's uh, forming the wall of the nasal cavity also. Uh, maxilla also, it uh, has the uh, tooth or teeth of the upper jaw. And uh, also, also, maxilla is forming the uh, floor of the orbit. So it's a um, very important bone. And uh, the basic and the central portion of the maxilla is body of the maxilla or corpus. This is the body. This is the body. This is the body. And uh, this is the body. So, uh, con inside the body, it's this uh, paranasal sinus or uh, maxillary uh, sinus. This is the central portion of the, uh, of the maxilla, which is called corpus or body. Body of the maxilla has four surfaces. Here, the anterior surface is anteriorly, or it's the face part or anterior surface. Then posteriorly is posterior surface or also is called the infratemporal surface because it's making the anterior wall of the uh, infratemporal fossa and pterygopalatine fossa. Also uh, cranially or superiorly we have or, uh, an orbital surface which is, as we said, is making a floor of the orbit. And finally, the medial surface, which is called nasal surface, because they are forming a part of the nasal cavity. So, uh, four surface, the anterior, in, uh, posterior or infratemporal, orbital and nasal surface. From the body, it's uh, coming out the four processes. So maxilla has four surfaces and four processes. This process that is going cranially, it's called frontal process. This process which is directed the laterally and is fused with the zygomatic bone and at this suture 
is called zygomatic process, it's called zygomatico maxillary uh, uh, suture here, and it's the zygomatic process of the maxilla, it's fusing with the um, maxillary process of the zygomatic bone. Then we have caudally, this part is called alveolar process, which is carrying the tooth or teeth of the upper jaw. And finally, the medial process, which is here, it's the palatine process, which are which is forming the uh, the hard palate that we said. So let me show you the surfaces and the processes that we have it in articulated articulated um, skull. So here it's defining the maxilla, the right maxilla, and here is the left maxilla. So here is anterior, this is the anterior surface. Here is the posterior surface. Here is the orbital surface. And finally the, the sorry, nasal surface which is toward the nasal cavity, maybe from the posterior side, I can show you better. So here inside is the nasal surface. So we have four processes, frontal process, cranially, alveolar process, caudally, zygomatic process, laterally and palatine process medially. I'm going to discuss each surfaces and each processes the detail of this structure. So, uh, at the anterior surface what we can find here, this tooth that you can see, it's the canine tooth. So here, if you recognize, this is the first incisor broken. Here it's the uh, lateral incisor or the second incisor, which is, is, a, is a socket of that tooth. And here is the canine. So here, at the region of the canine in anterior surface, we have uh, an uh, bony projection which is called canine eminence, canine eminence, here, exactly above the canine tooth, it has a, a canine eminence, and medial to the canine eminence you can see this fossa, this is called incisive fossa or sometimes it's called lateral fossa also, incisive fossa or lateral fossa. At the downward, at this region, is the place for the attachment of the orbicularis oris muscle. And here is the attachment of the depressor septi. And here it's the place for attachment of the dilate, dilate, dilator nares or dilator nares muscle, which is dilating the opening of the nasal cavity. So this is the incisive fossa. Then lateral to the canine fossa, this area is another fossa which is called canine fossa. Canine fossa is the place for the attachment of the levator anguli oris, the levator anguli oris. So this is laterally to the canine eminence. Here is this region is the canine fossa uh, is for the attachment of the levator anguli oris. This canine os fossa it's a, a very thin part of the uh, maxilla at the anterior surface and usually we use this, um, uh, this fossa uh, 
to uh, gain access to the uh, maxillary sinus or another name of the maxillary sinus that in clinic they are using is antrum hymori. Uh, so if you want to do operation inside the maxillary sinus with uh, any reason, for example, removing of the cyst or tumor, so uh, we open this maxillary sinus, uh, we are making a window inside and through this uh, bone uh, or this part, you are entering to the inside of the maxillary sinus and you are uh, removing the pathological structure. So this is the gaining access, the usual gaining access to the maxillary sinus, the canine fossa. Then uh, above the canine fossa, then it's very important foramen, here you can see. <clears throat> this is called infraorbital foramen. This is very important, this is a place for the injection of the anesthesia, the block injection of the anesthesia near to this foramen here uh, for the uh, for the numbness of the inferior infraorbital uh, nerve here in this region. So uh, infraorbital foramen, it's the place that uh, from this foramen it exists the infraorbital nerve and vessels. So here also is important for the palpation examination or pressure point uh, for the examination of the second branch of the trigeminal nerve which is maxillary nerve that uh, uh, it, it means that the infraorbital nerve is a branch of maxillary nerve and immediately um, above that here uh, at uh, this region is the uh, place for the attachment of the uh, levator labi superioris muscle. So the levator labi superioris muscle is covering the infraorbital uh, uh, foramen. Infraorbital foramen, it's the end part of the infraorbital canal and sulcus that uh, we are going to discuss it at the, in, at the orbital surface and they are locating at the orbital surface of the, uh, of the uh, maxilla. So uh, that is uh, regarding the, the uh, anterior uh, surface and the uh, anterior surface toward the, toward the um, alveolar process uh, you, have the, you have the projection or the prominence of the bone uh, especially you can find it and it's very nice you can see it in the uh, frontal uh, teeth so those are the uh, prominence of the root of the mainly anterior teeth because the vestibular or anterior part uh, of the bone is very thin than the palatine part. So if I move the root, you can see the movement of the root of the canine here. You can see, and you can see very thin bone here in this area of the uh, of the uh, 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 the vestibular part of the uh, maxilla, which is important for your clinic because first, uh, when you are going to do extraction of mainly the frontal teeth, so you have to be careful when you are moving vestibulopalatinal movement. So the movement, if you do it more pressure with the forceps the tooth uh, here when you catch it and you press it more palatinally so the root is pressing toward the vestibular side and it might break this very thin bone which is called the yuga alveolaris or juga alveolaris uh, those are the this is the terminology for this thin part of the uh, bone in this region of the root the prominence of the root and uh, it's broken or breaking the uh, vestibular plate of the bone and another important for the uh, anesthesia so we usually if you want to do the numbness of each teeth one by one you can do application of the anesthesia to the near to the apex of the uh, teeth of the upper jaw uh, and in this case when you are applying so the anesthetic agent through this thin bone it can do it can perfuse uh, to, to the uh, apical region and that the apical region it can uh, do the numbness of the nerve that they are going inside the uh, 
uh, root canal and the pulp chamber. So this is also another clinical important, uh, importance for the application of the anesthesia. And the third clinical importance also is that this uh, thin plate of the uh, vestibular side in the maxilla so it can uh, make the spread of infection uh, toward the vestibular side and in this case it can make the resorption of the bone and in this case the, it's making an abscess, the different abscess like a subperiostal abscess or subscess, abscess in the perimaxillary uh, region. So uh, that is all about the anterior surface. Then we are going and turning to the, to, toward the posterior surface or infratemporal uh, surface. So the transitional place it's very important area here. It's the very thick part of the bone, uh, which is immediately under the zygomatic process of the maxilla it is. So that's why they call it infrazygomatic crest. This is the thick part, that is uh, uh, the, th uh, the thickest part, more or less, of the maxilla that uh, it's uh, usually you can find it above the first molar tooth or the first molar tooth, uh, upper first molar of course and uh, here is the thickness of the uh, bone which is called infrazygomatic uh, crest. So infrazygomatic crest is the place that the uh, anterior surface is finishing and we are reaching to the posterior surface. The posterior surface it's uh, called also the infratemporal surface uh, because uh, because uh, it's uh, making the anterior border of the uh, the infratemporal fossa and medially the pterygopalatine fossa uh, as well. So if I again show it to you, so here is the place of the uh, infrazygomatic crest, the thick bony ridge here above the first molar. And here is the infratemporal uh, surface or posterior surface. And here, as you see, is the infratemporal fossa. And here is making the boundary, the anterior boundary uh, of the infratemporal fossa. And here is the pterygomaxillary fissure. And here it's going to the uh, pterygopalatine fossa, which is making the anterior border of the pterygopalatine. Uh, fossa as well. So the posterior aspect of the maxilla or the infratemporal fossa, uh, infratemporal surface or posterior surface of the maxilla, it's <coughs> making the making the uh, uh, the anterior border of the infratemporal fossa and the pterygopalatine uh, fossa. Uh, in uh, this area of the infratemporal surface or posterior surface you can see this structure which is called maxillary tuberosity. Maxillary tuberosity or Latin name is the tuber maxilla. Uh, it's very important and is very thin bone. You can see, please pay attention. Very important. It's very thin bone and is making a posterior wall of the posterior wall of the uh, maxillary sinus here. So uh, that uh, in a while I'm going to uh, tell you why it's important. The first uh, clinical importance is that in, uh, at the surface of the tuber maxilla you can see those foramines or foramina and canals. They are inside, they are the canals and the canals they are ending to these foramens those are the canals and foramens for the posterior superior alveolar nerves and vessels. Through these uh, canals that it has the same name, the posterior superior alveolar canals and posterior superior alveolars, uh, alveolar foramens, it passes the posterior superior alveolar nerve and artery for the supplying of the uh, distal teeth of the upper jaw, it means that mainly the molar, the third, third, second, and uh, first molar. So those are uh, innervated and supplied by these vessels and nerves that they are passing through these foramens. Uh, 
Another important uh, for this uh, tuber maxilla or maxillary tuberosity is that I said that pay attention that it's very thin. It's uh, during to the extraction of the mainly the third molar. So if you do uh, any, um, uh, uh, if you don't pay attention and if you uh, make a force, uh, uh, extra force to this area, for example, I can show you in this region. So here you can see the first molar, second molar, and third molar, which is the uh, impactor or sem semi-impacted or retained tooth. So when you are doing the extraction, you can see that very thin here is somehow is broken. So uh, with any extra force to this area, you can break the uh, maxillary tuberosity or tuber maxilla that it's making a complication. Uh, complication uh, with the with the maxillary sinus and it's making a problem for the healing uh, of the this extraction wound. Uh, this is the uh, important clinically that uh, very important for dentistry. You can see the projection of the tuber maxilla here inside the maxillary uh, sinus. Very nice. You can see. So this is the clinical importance in this area. So this uh, infratemporal surface uh, or posterior surface, crani cranially and posteriorly through this groove, it's related to the to the orbital surface of the uh, of the uh, uh, maxilla that I'm going to uh, discuss. So uh, here. It's the orbital surface of the maxilla. Or orbital surface of the maxilla, it's making a floor of the orbit, as we mentioned. And at the orbital surface, you can uh, hear the orbital surface is the place for attachment of the inferior oblique uh, muscle, is one of the, uh, um, the muscles of the orbit that we are going to, the, to discuss in the section of the sense organ. Uh, and uh, here in this region you can see this groove and uh, this uh, groove is called infraorbital groove and this groove anteriorly is lead to this canal which is called infraorbital canal and ending of this canal if you see the wire is coming out it's coming out through the infraorbital foramen at the anterior surface so in the orbital surface you have the infraorbital groove Infraorbital groove, then it's continue to the infraorbital canal, which is connecting the orbital surface with the anterior surface, and the canal it's open to the to the anterior surface at the infraorbital foramen. Through the groove, canal, and foramen, it pass infraorbital nerve, artery, and uh, uh, vein. Very important is that here you can see an articulated skull again. You can see the orbital part of the or surface of the maxilla, orbital surface of the maxilla. Orbital surface of the maxilla is related to the lacrimal bone here is related to the ethmoidal bone, the orbital plate of the ethmoidal bone, if you remember the lamina papyratse. And uh, finally, in the back side, it's uh, the, the uh, sphenoid bone and the orbital uh, process of the palatine bone that we said it, that it's a transitional place between the floor and medial wall of the uh, orbit. And here you can see the groove, the infraorbital groove, an infraorbital canal inside, and the infraorbital canal it's open to this foramen, which is called infraorbital uh, foramen. So what I wanted to uh, tell you, and it's very important, the 
place that the floor of the orbit or the orbital floor of the orbit or orbital plate or orbital surface of the maxilla uh, which is making a floor of the orbit the with the lateral wall of the orbit so it means that the place between the floor and the lateral wall of the orbit which is mainly made by the greater wing of the sphenoid bone, the orbital surface of the greater wing of the sphenoid bone, as you, if you remember. So you can see this fissure, this fissure, this fissure is called inferior orbital fissure, inferior orbital fissure. Through the inferior orbital fissure, it passes zygomatic nerve, infraorbital nerve and vessels, inferior ophthalmic vein, and this fissure also partially is closed by one muscle, a smooth muscle, muscle, which is called orbital muscle or orbitalis muscle. So once more, zygomatic nerve, infraorbital nerve and vessels, inferior ophthalmic vein, and orbitalis muscle is located at the inferior orbital fissure. If you remember here, and we are going to discuss the transition between the superior or roof of the orbit with the lateral wall of the orbit is another fissure here, which is called superior orbital fissure. That we said that it passed the structure that we studied at the section of the sphenoid bone, and we are, I'm going to discuss it again uh, for the section of the skull as a whole. So this is about the about the orbital surface of the of the uh, maxilla. To the uh, this canal and groove, they are passing the middle from the groove, the infraorbital groove that I mentioned it, it passing through the lateral wall of the body of the uh, maxilla, the middle superior alveolar nerve and vessels for the supplying of the premolar region, and through the canal which is connecting the inferior, the, uh, the uh, orbital surface with the anterior surface, it's passing inside the bone uh, the anterior and superior alveolar nerve and vessels for supplying of the frontal uh, segment of the uh, teeth of the upper jaw. So finally, the <clears throat> fourth, uh, fourth surface that I'm going to discuss is the uh, nasal surface. The, we call it nasal surface because uh, this part, the nasal part of the body of the uh, of the uh, maxilla, <coughs> is making a, a hiatus, the maxillary hiatus that you can see is relatively is very right, large, uh, and it's making the medial wall of the of the maxillary uh, sinus here, uh, which is called the opening, it's called a maxillary hiatus. This maxillary hiatus is obliterated by the uh, several other bony structure that I'm going to uh, discuss. So <clears throat> what is important here, uh, it's between the frontal process and uh, uh, the anterior border of the maxillary hiatus, there is a groove if you remember and you catch it here. This is the groove for the nasolacrimal duct that <clears throat> after is jo joining with the lacrimal bone that in a while I'm going to discuss about this. Here is the passage of the, if you, if you see exactly, is the passage of the nasolacrimal duct which is uh, starting from the, uh, uh, the lacrimal sac at this region and is entering and it ending to the inferior nasal meatus below the uh, inferior uh, concha and between the inferior concha and the floor of the nasal uh, cavity. <coughs> uh, another uh, structure that uh, we said that this is the 
maxillary hiatus. This maxillary hiatus, uh, as we said, is uh, opening of the maxillary sinus in the medial wall and uh, is uh, relatively is large, but uh, in the life uh, patient or person, so this uh, maxillary hiatus is diminished and is obliterated by some bony structure. For example, one bony structure that from the posteriorly it's uh, diminishing the size of the maxillary hiatus. It was the uh, palatine bone. So here uh, I have the palatine bone. If you remember uh, the L-shaped bone that it has a horizontal plate and the perpendicular plate, you can recognize which one is anterior, which one is posterior, via a large orbital process which is located more anteriorly and uh, laterally. Also, you can recognize via the pyramidal process that it's going to the dorsocaudal uh, lateral direction. So here is the dorsally. And uh, here, what I said is the perpendicular plate, and this is the anterior border of the perpendicular plate of the uh, palatine bone that uh, anteriorly is related to the nasal surface of the uh, maxilla. So if I show you here how uh, here in this region it's the maxillary hiatus and the uh, palatine bone it's diminishing the size of the maxillary hiatus in this position and uh, you, you can see from the posterior side it's the maxillary hiatus, it's uh, diminished the size or is, uh, the size it becomes smaller. Uh, this is one of the bony structure that they are obliterating the maxillary hiatus. Another structure that is obli uh, obliterating the maxillary hiatus uh, above and uh, in front is at this area, it's obliterating, it's the lacrimal bone. Another structure, uh, it's the maxillary process of the, uh, of the inferior nasal concha. It's diminishing also the size. And the uh, other, it's the uncinate process of the uh, middle nasal concha at this area, which if you remember, that is uh, joining with the ethmoidal process of the inferior nasal concha. And finally, in this area, it's uh, obliterated by the labyrinth part of the ethmoidal bone, uh, mainly the bulla ethmoidalis or ethmoidal bulla. So finally, the, uh, all this bony structure that they are obliterating this maxillary, large maxillary hiatus, uh, the only opening that it will be remaining, and in respiratory uh, uh, system I'm going to show you, it's the half a moon shape, uh, which is called uh, semilunar hiatus. The semilunar hiatus is the final uh, half a moon uh, shape structure of the opening of the maxillary uh, sinus or the uh, antrum hymori uh, that uh, we uh, discussed and it's very important that is open to the middle nasal uh, meatus. So uh, since uh, I have uh, this, uh, this uh, bone, I wanted to uh, also uh, show you uh, uh, clinical importance of this, uh, this uh, bone. So if I put the light uh, at the, uh, inside the maxillary sinus, you can see the floor of the maxillary sinus. Uh, the, the, the roof of the maxillary sinus, which is making the floor of the orbit, you can see is very thin, is very thin bone. And also you can see the, uh, the posterior here, pay attention. Posterior, the tuber maxilla or maxillary tuberosity, which is the posterior surface of the, uh, of the maxilla, it's very thin. So those are the place that, for example, the floor of the orbit is the most common uh, wall of the orbit that is fractured. It's called blowout fracture. So if you have uh, some uh, large, uh, large structure, like for example, this fist that is going toward the uh, toward the orbital region, so the hydraulic pressure that is going inside the orbit, it's making a uh, fracture usually the floor of the uh, 
uh, orbit and also uh, the medial wall of the uh, orbit which is uh, here and uh, it's made by the lacrimal and the papirazza if you remember is a very thin bone so uh, it's causing the uh, fracture which is called blowout uh, fracture here uh, you can see better uh, and uh, uh, usually you have to pay attention that if the infraorbital nerve uh, or vessels is uh, uh, trapped uh, inside uh, the uh, fracture uh, segment and also uh, the muscle, mainly the inferior oblique or the inferior rectus muscle is, uh, is trapped inside the fracture uh, segment. So uh, this is the important in maxillofacial surgery for the clinical examination and um, uh, it's called trapdoor fracture uh, of the uh, inferior uh, wall of the orbit. So that was the clinical uh, importance of this, uh, these uh, surfaces. So now we are going to discuss about, the, uh, about the, uh, each uh, processes. So first uh, concerning the alveolar process, the caudal process, which is al alveolar process, is containing the uh, teeth of the upper jaw. It means the socket for each teeth is uh, called uh, dental alveoli. And uh, between each uh, tooth, there is a septum, the bony septum, which is called inter alveolar or interdental septum which is separating each tooth from the other tooth. In the case of the multi-rooted or multi-rooted tooth, for example the molars that they have three roots usually, uh, the uh, bony septum or the bony ridge that they are separating the root or the radix of the teeth is called interradicular septum. So interalveolar or interdental septum, they are separating each tooth from each other. And uh, the interradicular septum, they are separating the radix of one uh, tooth in the case of the multi-rooted uh, multi uh, tooth. About the alveolar juga or yuga, we said that is the bony prominence that they are mainly seen in the, at the, uh, at the uh, frontal segment and uh, we said about the clinical uh, importance. Uh, just uh, one uh, more uh, uh, important clinical important here about the maxillary tuberosity or tuber maxilla. Here is the place for the application of the anesthesia uh, in this region. Uh, so uh, uh, it's important uh, for the block anesthesia of the posterior superior alveolar uh, nerve and uh, the, the, the direction of the needle, it must be fully respected that it will be always in contact with the bone, the needle. So if the needle, it will be in this region and uh, to, the, uh, to the infratemporal fossa, you can puncture the uh, pterygoid venous plexus that is located here and it can cause uh, severe bleeding and it can cause the uh, very uh, big hematome uh, or hematoma in uh, this uh, region. So uh, this is about the uh, alveolar process that it contains the, uh, uh, the upper teeth. Uh, regarding the uh, cranial process which is here and it's uh, the uh, frontal process cranially, uh, this uh, structure that it's when it's fusing with the other uh, shape of the maxilla uh, so it's, uh, it's making an aperture which is called preform aperture. Preform is aperture or preform aperture that is look uh, that uh, um, uh, it's arising from the shape of the preform or pear sh shape uh, that uh, it's making a contour of the uh, nasal uh, cavity. This is the preform aperture. So <clears throat> at the uh, apex of this aperture, uh, when it's joining with the palatine process, and we are going to discuss here anteriorly, we have the anterior nasal spine, and this anterior nasal spine is the place for attachment of the uh, septal cartilage of the uh, 
uh, uh, septal cartilage uh, of the uh, cartilaginous part of the septum which is attaching uh, in this region. So uh, for better understanding that uh, how the frontal process is uh, matching with the other bone, I will show you the articulated skull. So once more, here is the frontal process of the maxilla. Cranially is joining and fusing with the nasal part of the of the frontal bone, sometimes they call it nasal notch. So anteriorly is related to the nasal bone here at this suture, is the boundary between them. And posteriorly is related to the lacrimal bone. Here is the lacrimal bone, very important. So this frontal process of the maxilla it uh, has a relation with the frontal bone superiorly, nasal bone anteriorly, and lacrimal bone posteriorly. Very important structure here is, is this crest. This crest is called anterior lacrimal crest. For sure you remember that we discussed that lacrimal bone at anterior edge, it has a crest which is called posterior lacrimal crest. And between the posterior lacrimal crest of the lacrimal bone and anterior lacrimal crest of the frontal process of the maxilla, it will remind the groove. Each bone has the lacrimal groove. This is the lacrimal groove of the lacrimal bone. And this is the lacrimal groove of the frontal process of the maxilla. So when they are going in front of each other and opposite to each other, it's making a sulcus or groove, which is called lacrimal groove. You can see here. Through this lacrimal groove, if you go caudally, you will reach to the dilation part which is called fossa saxi lacrimalis. This is the fossa for the lacrimal sac. And in this fossa is starting the canal that if you remember, if you see it from the nasal cavity, the red, this called the nasolacrimal canal, that through this canal it passed the nasolacrimal duct that it's open to the inferior nasal meatus that here I was trying to explain it to you here, the opening of the nasolacrimal canal and open to the inferior nasal meatus. So regarding to the nasal surface, so here it was the uh, lateral, the, 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 the lateral surface of the uh, the frontal process of the maxilla and here we have the nasal surface of the uh, frontal process of the maxilla. For the nasal surface of the frontal process of the maxilla you have the similar crest that we mentioned it for the palatine bone at the perpendicular plate. We have one inferior crest which is called the uh, conchal crest is more or less horizontally is located and this is the place for the attachment of the inferior nasal Concha. And another crest which is here and is diagonal shape and is more or less is obliquely is passing here is called the uh, ethmoidal crest and this is the place for the attachment of the uh, middle nasal concha. So middle nasal concha it's uh, attached to just the posterior part of this crest in this area that I uh, show it to you by the wire. So here is the place for attachment. And here in front of them, in front of them, uh, it's the free border for the um, uh, structure which is called agar nazi. Uh, here uh, at the uh, at the perpendicular plate of the of the uh, um, uh, palatine bone, we had similar crest that we said. It's the conchal crest for the inferior uh, inferior um, nasal concha, and here it was the. 
uh, ethmoidal crest for the middle nasal conchal. So the similar these two crests also you can find it at the nasal surface of the frontal process of the maxilla. So the uh, conchal crest and ethmoidal uh, crest. So uh, this is, uh, that's why then you can see here that if it is the place of the attachment of the inferior nasal concha and this is the floor of the, uh, of the nasal cavity. So this area is the entrance to the uh, hiatus of the inferior nasal uh, meatus. So it's the entrance to the inferior nasal meatus, which is this area that sometimes uh, we are doing some operation and uh, in this area we can do some uh, fenestration or the window, bony window for the better ventilation of the uh, maxillary sinus in the case of the obstruction of the uh, semilunar uh, hiatus in this uh, region. But of course we have to respect the uh, nasolacrimal, uh, the course of the nasolacrimal duct that is passing anteriorly. So uh, we talked about the, uh, the uh, alveolar process, we talked about the uh, frontal process, and we are going to talk about the, uh, the, about the zygomatic process. The zygomatic process, which is oriented laterally, uh, it's uh, joining with the maxillary process of the zygomatic bone. So at this suture, which is called the uh, zygomatico-maxillary uh, uh, suture, this uh, zygomatic process is the uh, triangular uh, shape process that it's the uh, transitional uh, place between the anterior surface, the posterior surface, and the orbital surface. So as you see the orbital surface also it's related to the, to the uh, zygomatic uh, process uh, laterally. Uh, then this uh, uh, zygomatic process that we said that under that is the bony crest, the T crest, which is called infrazygomatic uh, crest, which is above the first molar. So sometimes this thick bony place, it's making a problem for applying the infiltration anesthesia. If you apply anesthesia here for the first molar, uh, sometimes uh, it can be making a problem because of this thick part of the crest, of the bony crest, so the uh, anesthetic agent it cannot uh, uh, pass through this thick plate of the bone and uh, then it can cause a problem. But nowadays we have a very perfect, a good uh, anesthetic agent that the perfusion is perfect through this uh, bone. So uh, this is the this is the um, about the zygomatic process and zygomatic process is the uh, place that is localizing the apex of the maxillary sinus because maxillary sinus is somehow the pyramidal shape and the apex of this pyramid it's uh, if I put the needle so here you can see the uh, tip of the needle here toward the. Uh, toward the uh, zygomatic process of the maxilla. So the apex of the maxillary sinus is toward the zygomatic process of the uh, maxilla. So uh, this is the third process and finally we have the, uh, the process which is directed medially and is called palatine process. This is the palatine process of the uh, uh, maxilla. Uh, the palatine process of the maxilla, uh, I can uh, show you in this uh, part, in this bone. Uh, it's better seen. As a matter of fact, if you look at it, uh, the region of the incisor, so here is the first incisor, here is the lateral incisor, and here is the socket for the canine. And here is the first incisor, lateral incisor, and here is the socket of the canal. So if you uh, pay attention, there is a suture here. This is the suture which is called incisive suture. Incisive suture, it's separating this part that it containing the first and lateral incisors, left and right as a separate bone because it has a separate origin uh, 
and this bone is called paramaxilla or incisive bone. Then in adult, this suture it will be by the time it uh, fused and ossified and it making a part of the palatine process of the maxilla. So that's why the palatine process of the maxilla plus the pre-maxilla it's the uh, place uh, that they are making the anterior two-third or anterior three-quarter of the hard palate. The posterior part is made by the horizontal plate of the, uh, of the uh, palatine uh, bone. So uh, in this area here, there is a foramen at the incisive bone or premaxilla that is immediately behind the uh, approximately one centimeter behind the uh, central incisor in this region, there is a fossa which is called the, uh, uh, there is a foramen which is called nasopalatine foramen, nasopalatine foramen. And uh, if you look at it from the nasal surface, here there are two canal, one is here, and the other is here, very nice, you can see. Here they are called incisive canal. The incisive canal, it means that from the nasal side, there are two and they are paired, one is here and one is here. But when we are going to the palatine side, the, this two nasal canal, they are open to one foramen, which is called incisive foramen. Through this nasal canal, uh, incisive canal and incisive foramen, it passes the nasopalatine nerve and vessels. And again, this foramen, it's the place for the uh, injection, uh, injection of the anesthesia, for the block anesthesia of the nasopalatine nerve uh, block. Maybe in this picture, you can see the better uh, foramen. The, so there is a one foramen in palatine side. It's the incisive foramen. And in the nasal side, in the other side to the nasal cavity, there are the two incisive canal that they are joining and they are opening in one foramen. So uh, this is uh, regarding the regarding the, uh, the incisive part, and uh, then uh, we have the palatine process of the maxilla. The palatine process of the uh, maxilla uh, uh, it has two surfaces. One surface here, which is very rough. It's called palatine surface and is making a hard palate, it's a part of the hard palate. This uh, rough surface is due to the, uh, the uh, location of the palatine glands here, mainly in the posterior part, there are accumulation of the palatine glands, so that's why in this surface we have the roughness. But uh, the other surface, which is uh, here, that they are making the floor of the nasal cavity, uh, here is the nasal surface and it's smooth. Uh, here, if I show it to you, so uh, uh, this is the this is the superior uh, surface of the palatine process, which is a smooth, smooth, and it's uh, uh, making the floor of the nasal cavity. And here is the palatine surface that you can see is very rough, no? rough and it's because of the uh, position of the or location of the palatine gland. And here, uh, somehow you can see it in this cross section of the bone through, here is one of the incisive canal that is going down and here in this area is open at the, uh, at the uh, incisive foramen, approximately one centimeter behind the, uh, incis as the central incisor here. This is the central incisor and here is the place. So you can see approximately very nice part of the canal, one of the incisive canal. It means in the right maxilla.
So uh, then uh, another structure that you can see it in the <clears throat> at the nasal surface here. This is the bony crest uh, in the midline. is called the uh, is called the nasal uh, septum, and this nasal septum is the place for attachment of the vomer, which is making the uh, the uh, dorsal uh, dorsal caudal part of the nasal uh, septum. But in the palatine side. If you see it here, so the two palatine process of the maxilla, they are fusing together at this uh, place, uh, which is called the uh, median palatine suture, or sometimes it's called intermaxillary uh, suture, and uh, 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 this is the place in the midline that if you look at the uh, oral cavity you can see is covered by the mucous membrane and uh, is the place for the palatine rough uh, here uh, so uh, here in this area sometimes it's uh, make it's uh, possible to uh, have a, a overgrowing of the bone and uh, is exactly in this midline of the uh, heart palate is located and it's called torus palatinus, and uh, this is just an overgrow of the bone, and uh, it doesn't have any pain for the patient, just it making a problem when you are making a denture, for example, for the patient, and the bench denture is not fit in this area, so that's why surgically it can be removed, the torus palatinus in this uh, area. So here, finally, the uh, the... Uh, posterior, uh, the posterior uh, uh, part of the uh, palatine process is fusing with the horizontal plate of the palatine board at this suture, which is called transverse palatine uh, suture. And as we mentioned it also before, in front at the uh, uh, tip of the uh, palatine process, there is a uh, anterior uh, nasal spine for the attaching of the septal uh, cartilage. The uh, last uh, uh, information uh, concerning the concerning the frontal uh, process of the maxilla is that this frontal process of the maxilla is like a butters. Uh, they are transmitting the masticatory force from the incisors. Uh, and frontal teeth toward the incisors, toward the maxillary, uh, the frontal process of the maxilla to the uh, cranial uh, base, and this is the way of the transmission of the masticatory force from the incisors to the uh, base of the uh, skull. So uh, this is uh, this is uh, all about this uh, uh, very nice bone. Uh, maxilla, uh, which is making a, a, a upper jaw, and it has a very important clinical uh, importance for uh, for the doctor and especially for uh, dentists. Okay, next bone is um, mandible or lower jaw. Uh, mandible or lower jaw, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, in uh, newborn. Uh, they are left, uh, right, and left uh, mandible. That in the, at the midline in this place, uh, they are fusing to each other. <clears throat> this place is called uh, symphysis menti. Symphysis menti. Uh, this um, uh, fusion is not through the cartilage. So as a matter of fact, here uh, it was uh, fibrous uh, or fibrous connective tissue. <clears throat> that uh, by the time uh, it become ossification, uh, the ossified, and um, then and this two half of the mandible they are fusing together uh, um, uh, at this symphysis menti, and uh, usually this um, ossification is happening at the end of first year of the uh, life. And symphysis they call it because it's located in the at the midline. So uh, generally, if, uh, if I want to discuss about the uh, mandible, uh, mandible it has a parabolar uh, shape, the uh, maxilla, uh, maxillary or the uh, maxillary or upper dental arch, it's uh, ellipsoid. Uh, it contains of uh, 
three main uh, parts the body of the mandible then the ascending part which is called the ramus of the mandible and the transition between the body and the ramus this area is called the uh, angle of the mandible or mandibular angle uh, the mandible of course it has the external surface or outer surface and the internal surface or inner surface we are uh, I'm going to discuss about the each part so uh, at the body region or the uh, corpus in um, anterior side you can see this triangular shape this triangular shape this is called mental protuberance mental protuberance it's forming the chin of the uh, lower jaw and uh, at the dorsal lateral part you can see these two tubercle which are called the mental tubercle mental tubercle so this triangle is called the uh, the mental protuberance and the dorsolaterally or infralaterally um, uh, it's uh, has a two tubercle which is called mental tubercle then uh, if you go above uh, the uh, near to the <coughs> alveolar process like a mandible <coughs> has uh, the same as maxilla it has uh, an alveolar process which is containing the teeth of the lower uh, jaw and uh, you can see like a maxilla you have a dental uh, the socket for the each tooth which is called dental alveoli and uh, each socket they are separated from each other via this bony septum which is called the interalveolar septum and in the case of the multi-rooted tooth so between the root they are uh, interradicular septum the same information that we had it uh, uh, at the uh, at the uh, maxilla so again uh, another uh, important uh, things in the at the frontal section of the uh, mandible especially in the incisor incisor uh, incisive region when they are the incisors they are located and sometimes canine again you can see a bony prominence at the vestibular side or outer side which are called juga alveolaris or yuga alveolaris and those are the prominence of the root of the frontal teeth and in this case we understand that the vestibular side or outer side the bone the bony lamella it's uh, very thin and this is uh, allow us to do the infiltration anesthesia for the frontal segment of the uh, lower jaw uh, for the uh, application of the anesthesia so uh, here one clinical aspect the other one is the spread of infection toward the, this uh, very thin bony part in the vestibular side uh, it's causing the spread of infection to the vestibular side and uh, causing the vestibular uh, abscess in this area but as you see if you are going toward the distal side the thickness of the bone it become uh, more so that's why uh, here whenever you apply the infiltration anesthesia here so it doesn't perforate it through the this very thick compact bone of the uh, body so uh, again here around the uh, incisors here in the uh, at the body you can find the fossa which is called incisive fossa and this incisive fossa is the place for attachment of the mentalis muscle and also then the lower part so is for attachment of the orbicularis uh, oris muscle uh, concerning the uh, the uh, mental protuberance that we mentioned it and if we go if we go uh, toward the inferior border of the mandible this is the inferior border of the body of the mandible and uh, which is making the base of the mandible and you can see that in the uh, at the inferior part and in inner surface you can see two fossa those two shallow fossa uh, which is uh, the is called digastric fossa is the place for the attachment of the anterior belly of digastric muscle 
That's why it's called the diagnostic fossa. It's under the mental tubercle and in the inner surface of the mandible uh, near to the inferior margin of the mandible. So uh, again, if you are uh, going toward the lateral side of the body, uh, you can see a very uh, important foramen here, which is called the mental foramen. The mental foramen uh, it's, uh, it's the ending of the uh, canal which is called mandibular canal in a while I'm going to show you and uh, through this mental foramen is exiting the uh, mental nerve plus vessels and this is the place for the pressure point or palpation examination of the third branch of the uh, trigeminal nerve which is called uh, mandibular nerve uh, here is the place of the palpation examination or pressure point uh, for this region. And this ventral uh, foramen is uh, located, uh, if you count the uh, tooth, so you can see that this is first incisor, second incisor, this is the uh, dental alveoli of the uh, canine, and this is the first premolar and this is the second premolar. So exactly under the apex of the uh, second premolar or between the between and under the apex of the uh, first and second premolar is the exact uh, position of the mental foramen that here it's coming out the mental nerve and the vessels and uh, again so here is the place for the for the injection of the uh, anesthesia for uh, mental foramen, it's the block anesthesia for the mental uh, nerve that it must be directed from the distal part toward the mental foramen because this mental uh, uh, foramen is or the canal is opening and is turning distally like this so uh, it's better for the application of the anesthesia from the distally inter uh, toward the mental uh, foramen. So uh, then uh, 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 a very important clinical as aspect of this mental foramen uh, it's uh, uh, that this is the height of the, of the body of the mandible and uh, usually the mental, man uh, mental foramen uh, in adult it's located in the mid midpoint of the height of the uh, mandible so uh, the body of the mandible but uh, in uh, newborn or in a child the mental foramen is a little bit is located more lower this is one in newborn but vice versa in uh, older people that uh, they are losing the uh, the teeth and uh, it, the atrophy of the uh, alveolar process is happening so uh, because of the non-functional uh, alveolar process the uh, jaw or the alveolar this bony part of the alveolar process is become atrophized and it's diminishing the height of the alveolar process then it will be diminishing the height of the uh, body of the mandible till the place of the attachment of the muscles that I'm going to show and in this case in elder people I can show you here as you see the mental foramen is uh, here is more superiorly you can see here and uh, this is um, also uh, can cause a problem uh, for these people when they are when the dentist is making a denture so when you are putting the denture so the patient <clears throat> if you don't respect the highly uh, superiorly located of the mental foramen here in this region so the denture, the, the denture can press uh, the mental nerve and is making a pain so uh, you can release this pain by the correcting of the, uh, the denture in this area and releasing the pressure from the this area so uh, so in adult, the mental foramen is in the middle, in newborn is lower, and in elder people that they are losing the tooth, they are located in the uh, superior part. Then uh, if we are going, we are talking uh, still about the uh, um, external surface. 
So uh, when I'm going uh, toward the uh, distal portion of the, uh, of the mandible, so here in this region, I can see the angle of the mandible. The angle of the mandible is the transitional place between the body and the ramus of the uh, mandible. The angle of the mandible in adult, it's a sharp angle. So usually it's approximately between 110 till 120, uh, more than uh, 90, deg uh, 90 uh, degree, it will be the angle in adult. But in newborn or in elder people, the angle is becoming uh, more wider uh, and uh, more bigger, so it becomes, uh, they call it obtu obtuse angle, so, or uh, angulus obtusus, so the angle approximately is becoming more around 140, so in newborn and in elder people, but in adult is sharp angle, more than 90, around 110 till 120. <clears throat> At the region of the uh, external surface of the angle of the mandible, we can see some roughness. This roughness is the place for the attachment of the uh, masseter muscle, one of the masticatory muscle which is attaching here, it's inserting here and it's called <clears throat> masseteric tuberosity. Masseteric tuberosity. So that's why uh, this roughness at the external surface of the angle of the uh, mandible is called masseteric tuberosity. Then <clears throat> we have another uh, roughness that you can see it here in the internal surface and <clears throat> is the place for the attachment of the medial uh, pterygoid muscle and it's called the, uh, the uh, uh, pterygoid tuberosity at the internal surface of the angle of the mandible that I'm going to discuss at the internal surface. So, uh, regarding the external surface of the mandible, uh, we discuss about the angle of the mandible that it was a roughness which is called masseter, uh, uh, masseteric tuberosity for attachment of the masseter muscle. And then from the uh, angle of the mandible, we have uh, ascending part of the mandible which is called the ramus of the mandible. The ramus of the mandible superiorly is end up to two processes. One process which is located posteriorly is called a uh, condylar process. A condylar process is uh, making the head of the mandible. The head of the mandible is uh, uh, basically it's ellipsoid shape and it's uh, horizontally it's directed. This horizontally is approximately to the uh, ventro, uh, ventro laterally here if you look at it. So it's, there is a ventro laterally, it's going to the dorsal uh, medial direction, approximately the uh, length of this uh, horizontal dimension is approximately two centimeter. So uh, the head of the mandible or condylar process, it's making a, a head for the uh, temporomandibular joint. Uh, we discussed it or we are going to discuss. Uh, this head of the mandible is articulated with the mandibular fossa and uh, a part of the uh, articular tubercle or articular eminence of the, uh, of the uh, squamous part of the temporal bone and uh, those they are making the uh, articular facet for the uh, head of the mandible and of course between them is uh, articular disc or discus articularis which is dividing this uh, joint uh, cavity to two parts that uh, we are going to discuss the details of the temporomandibular joint. So uh, back to this, uh, this uh, um, condylar uh, part or uh, the head of the uh, mandible, uh, the other process which is more sharper and is located anteriorly is called coronoid process and uh, sometimes it's called the muscular process because this uh, process is the place for the attachment of the temporalis muscle or insertion of the temporalis muscle uh, and downward uh, it's the place uh, for the attachment of this muscle and between this uh, condylar part and the uh, uh, coronoid uh, process or uh, the, uh, the uh, muscular process there is a notch which is called mandibular notch. Through this notch, it passing the masseteric nerve and <clears throat> vessels 
uh, that it's uh, if you dissect it so you can find the masseteric nerve and vessels in this uh, area which is the mandibular notch regarding the uh, the coronoid process if from the coronoid process you go uh, down you can see the anterior margin of the uh, mandible this is the anterior border or anterior margin of the mandible and this anterior margin or anterior border of the mandible is continue obliquely here to this region near to the ventral foramen and uh, this is called external oblique ridge external oblique ridge is the bony ridge that uh, is continuation of the anterior border and it's continue obliquely uh, and toward the uh, mental uh, foramen. So this is the external oblique line, they call it, or external oblique uh, ridge. So uh, this is uh, regarding the uh, external surface. What we can find it in the internal surface. So <clears throat> if you uh, uh, see it, so here in the uh, anterior side of the body, we said that we have two fossa. Here is a very nice scene here. It's the digastric fossa and it's the place for the attachment of the anterior belly of digastric muscle. So if we go farther, more, at the midline we can see a, a spine. Usually though uh, this spine there are two. One is the superior spine and the other is inferior spine. And uh, this is called mental spine. And if it is two, so they are superior and inferior mental spine. Uh, the inferior mental spine is the place for the attachment of the geniohyoid muscle and the superior uh, mental spine is the place for attachment of the genioglossus muscle. So this is an uh, important um, uh, structure for attachment of these two uh, muscles. Then you can see here it's another line which is from the superiorly, it's going, and posteriorly, it go, is going directed anteriorly and inferiorly. This is the mylohyoid line. The mylohyoid line, and according to its name, it's the place for attachment of the mylohyoid muscle. It's the very important muscle for the, uh, for the um, division of the two important regions. Here is the sublingual region above the mylohyoid line and under that is this region which is the submandibular uh, region under the mylohyoid line for the attachment of the mylohyoid muscle. So if we find the, uh, and we appreciate this uh, mylohyoid line, you can see that above the mylohyoid line and anteriorly you can find some uh, depression or uh, fovea, which is called sublingual fovea. Sublingual fovea, which is here, is the place for the location of the sublingual gland, one of the major saliva salivary uh, gland, which is located uh, here above and anterior to the mylohyoid line. And uh, further uh, uh, more about the posterior region, it means that in this region, is another fovea which is called submandibular fovea which is in the posterior part and below the mylohyoid line it's the, uh, it means that below mylohyoid muscle is the place which is called the uh, fova submandibularis or submandibular fova is the place for the attachment or, or for the location of the submandibular gland it's another, another uh, major salivary gland then uh, we are going uh, uh, at the region of the uh, angle of the mandible that we uh, mentioned it. Uh, in the internal surface of the angle you can see this roughness is the place for attachment of the or insertion of the medial pterygoid muscle. It's the one of the other masticatory muscle which is attaching so that's why it's called it pterygoid tuberosity. And then finally at the middle of the ramus of the mandible, we have very, very important muscle, uh, foramen, which is called mandibular foramen. Mandibular foramen 
it's the place that through this foramen it pass or, or is enter uh, to the canal that uh, inside the bone this canal it passing all and it's ending to this foramen as a mental foramen that we mentioned it so the starting of this canal which is called mandibular canal and uh, is at the uh, mandibular foramen which is here and ending of this mandibular canal it's at the this foramen which is called mental foramen so uh, through this foramen and canal the mandibular canal and mandibular foramen it pass inferior alveolar nerve and vessels inferior alveolar nerve and vessels so uh, immediately below this foramen mandibular foramen you can see groove be careful not is not line but is a groove which is called mylohyoid groove <coughs> or mylohyoid sulcus this is the place for the passing of the mylohyoid nerve and uh, vessels uh, that is a, as a matter of fact is a branch of the inferior alveolar nerve and vessels that before they enter to the canal so they are giving the branch which is called mylohyoid nerve and mylohyoid vessels and finally uh, in front of the and above the mandibular foramen you can see this tongue shape uh, structure bony structure which is called mandibular lingula mandibular lingula this is the bony structure here in front and above the mandibular uh, mandibular uh, foramen and this is the place for the attachment of the one of the ligament of the temporomandibular joint which is called sphenomandibular ligament so sphenomandibular ligament which was uh, originated from the um, angular spine or the uh, sphenoidal spine uh, of the sphenoid bone and is inserted to the here as a lingula of the mandible or mandibular uh, lingula is one of the ligament of the uh, temporomandibular joint then <clears throat> if you uh, look at the uh, region of the uh, 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 last molar region so here uh, because the molar is not existing so uh, uh, that's why so it's replaced by the bone uh, so here in this area behind the last molar it means the third molar so there is a trigon which is called retromolar trigon retromolar trigon and uh, continue to the retromolar fossa in this area and this is the place for the uh, location of the minor salivary glands which are grouped uh, which are called the retromolar group or the molar uh, groups of the minor salivary glands so and also this retromolar triangle is the place for the insertion of the pterygomandibular ligament or the pterygomandibular rafe or bucopharyngeal uh, rafe in this region so uh, another structure that i can uh, show you here as we said that here is the uh, or maybe here is better so now here was the coronoid process and here is the anterior margin of the mandible which is externally is going as an external oblique ridge or line and here internally above the uh, the retromolar triangle there is a crest here which is called the uh, temporal crest the temporal crest here which is also is the attachment of the uh, temporalis muscle here in this uh, region and uh, maybe I can show you here the uh, better position of the of the uh, crest here is the child mandible and uh, here is the retromolar triangle and uh, here is the uh, temporal crest and here is the anterior margin and here is going the external oblique when you can see the uh, you can see the uh, 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 the um, teeth uh, one it's, what is uh, important one important uh, uh, important uh, information uh, maybe uh, for you is that uh, 
uh, in adult, the uh, coronoid process uh, and the condylar process, more or less, they are approximately, they are located in which, in the same level, uh, in, uh, at the newborn, so the coronoid process, it's located more higher than the uh, condylar uh, uh, process. So this is uh, another information, uh, the difference between the newborn skull and the, uh, the adult skull. So the adult skull, approximately this coronoid and condylar, they are at the same level, but in the newborn, so the coronoid process is much more, uh, much more uh, higher. The mandible, because it's the uh, uh, very important bone and very prominent bone <clears throat> uh, in the face region or in splanchnal cranium, is uh, usually is the first bone that is, uh, in the case of the injury, uh, it will be uh, uh, injured uh, because it's prominent anteriorly and uh, usually the fracture of the mandible is happening here in the midline at the level of the symphysis menti. Uh, some uh, another uh, um, uh, most common fracture it will be uh, at the level of the canine because the canine it has a very strong root and it's in this case it's making um, the part of the bone um, weaker and uh, the other <clears throat> place of the fracture it's usually happening at the level of the angle of the mandible and the last uh, most common fracture of the mandible it can be uh, behind, below the, um, the uh, head of the mandible which is the neck of the mandible that I forgot to uh, tell you. Here in, in, uh, at the region of the neck of the mandible so uh, uh, once more uh, here is the head of the mandible or the condylar uh, process of the mandible so immediately below that is the place the narrow place which is called the neck of the mandible and uh, below the head of the mandible at the neck of the mandible there is a uh, this uh, small depression which is called pterygoid fovea the pterygoid fovea is the place for the uh, the uh, attachment of the uh, inferior uh, head of the lateral uh, pterygoid uh, muscle. So the pterygoid uh, fovea is the insertion, is the place for the insertion of the inferior head of the lateral pterygoid muscle, which is the another masticatory muscle that we are going to discuss uh, in the uh, case of the uh, temporomandibular uh, joint and masticatory muscle. And finally, uh, the last uh, and very important clinical uh, uh, information uh, for the uh, mandibular foramen. This is the uh, the foramen that uh, you are doing uh, or dentist is uh, giving the injection uh, to this uh, above this foramen approximately around this area which is called fossa coli mandibuli uh, or uh, uh, in this area at the pterygomandibular space uh, here is the place for the application of the block anesthesia of the inferior alveolar nerve and this is one of the most important application of anesthesia in dentistry uh, that uh, the details uh, which are direct and indirect method it will be discussed in the preclinic dentistry. So uh, here it's the uh, place that you can do the numbness of the inferior alveolar nerve and in this case uh, 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 half of the mandible, uh, it will be numbed uh, uh, by the application of this block anesthesia. Of course, you have to uh, additionally add the uh, anesthesia to the lingual nerve and long buccal nerve that we are going to discuss. So <clears throat> this is all about the uh, mandible. So dear students, uh, that's all about the uh, bones of the, the uh, separate bones of the uh, skull uh, regarding the neurocranial part and the splanchnocranial part. Uh, then uh, in the next, at uh, the next video, so we are going to discuss about the uh, skull as a whole. It means that we are going to revise all the foramens and fissures and the parts. Uh, that we uh, already we mentioned it uh, as a separate bone, uh, we mentioned it as a uh, skull as a whole, and also I'm going to discuss about uh, some 
topographical, topographical relationship of the uh, some spaces of the skull uh, with each other. So uh, at the end, as usual, um, I would like to uh, thank uh, my colleague Dr. Petrashek for his help and uh, I wish you have a nice day and uh, uh, stay safe and study hard. Thank you for your attention.